Good morning, Chicago. I'm Dr. Allison Arwady, Commissioner of the Chicago Department of Public Health. And as always, we're back taking your COVID questions. Today is Thursday, August 5th, 2021. And there continues to be a whole lot going on in the world of COVID, nationally, across the state, locally. We were really pleased to see the uh, governor's announcement yesterday that masks would be required uh, for all um, elementary and high school, K through 12, schools across Illinois. Uh, we absolutely think that is the safest and most appropriate way to start school um, and especially critical for elementary and junior high settings where kids are largely too young to be vaccinated. Um, so where you have your COVID questions, you can put them directly into the box below on Facebook or Twitter. You can also use the hashtag AskDrArwady and we'll spend most of the time today answering your questions directly. But first, uh, as always, let's turn to the dashboard, chai.gov slash COVID dash. We're updating this Monday through Friday. Uh, every bit of this gets updated. The summaries, the cases, the cases by zip code, the testing and positivity data, the vaccine data, the vaccine by zip code data. So you can see we're averaging 260 cases per day right now that does continue uh, to rise, not in a way that is unexpected, not at a rate that is unexpected. And we are very strongly seeing this fall on folks who are unvaccinated. Um, we are averaging 19 hospitalizations a day, also seeing some increase there. Similarly, uh, falling on folks who are unvaccinated. I do want to note these are on different scales. So uh, these cases here, this marks 500 and this marks 50 um, uh, in terms of the scales of those two charts. We've gotten a question about that. Uh, we're averaging um, still just between one and two deaths a day, um, the, the, the best broadly that we've, we've been uh, throughout COVID. Our vaccinations have ticked up, which I've been pleased, pleased to see. We're back um, doing about 4,100 a day, and uh, that's been holding steady. We're doing about 8,600 tests a day. That's also on the increase, which is not surprising at all. That's what we expect and what we see as cases increase and there's more folks with symptoms and more folks concerned about COVID. Um, and we strongly, strongly encourage people, if you have symptoms that could be COVID, you have a quote, summer cold, you feel like you have the flu, you're just not feeling well, get tested. Uh, those home-based tests uh, are good, please use them. They're cheap, they're widely available. They're not necessarily reported to public health. So this is one of the places where uh, we think a little bit differently about, there is a lot of testing that happens in the world that doesn't come through these dashboards, but we've got other ways to account for some of that. The most important thing is that you're getting tested um, and that if it's positive, you're following up. If you report that, uh, you know, to your doctor, for example, or to the health department, um, we will take it from there. And then our positivity rate is at 3.5%, um, also still below 5% at the moment, um, and that's where we are. I wanna just note quickly that um, on the vaccine front, uh, we're at about 69% of everybody over the age of 12, about 70% over the age of 18, about 74% over the age of 65. And it's really that oldest group um, that remains the one that I'm the most concerned about. Where you break this down more by age, you see um, we've now got you know almost 52%, so we've crossed that 50% mark of our adolescents. 12 to 17 year olds have gotten at least that first dose. Um, and uh, it just goes up from there. We're about 60% almost of our 18 to 29 year olds. You can see we peak in the people in their 50s and 60s, and then it starts to drop off people in their 70s and then over 80. And I am not pleased with a 65% um, first dose and 59% full vaccination rate for people over 80. So um, especially with, with Delta on the increase. So, um, you know, we're working the most on both ends of this spectrum, uh, but we have room to grow across all age groups. And I'll just show you, um, you can look by gender, you can look by race, ethnicity, but you can also look at any of these, for example, the percent vaccinated over time or the daily average doses. So just to kind of give you a sense of this, um, this is uses the same colors as we do across the whole dashboard. So the dark blue are the 12 to 17 year olds. And you know, you can see as you hover, it will pull up what in any given week was going on, what is changing. Um, and this was, this was when we saw the approval for those younger um, adolescents. But still, if you, if you zoom in, 
um, we were doing the most vaccinations in those younger age groups, which is good because it's where we have um, the most room to room to grow. So I encourage you to explore this and, and explore the zip code page. I also just wanted to very quickly highlight uh, where we are as a city. Um, sorry, slideshow from beginning. Okay. Uh, so. Again, these are the same metrics that we've been using all along, more than a year. And you can see that our case rate has moved into that substantial transmission, uh, which we used to call moderate, but we're calling it substantial because that's the word CDC uses. Uh, that's exactly, these are the same cutoffs um, as, as what CDC uses to define substantial transmission or high transmission. Um, and our test positivity remains in that lower transmission risk range. Um, we've got about 150 58 people hospitalized across Chicago um, with COVID in non-ICU beds and another 46 in ICU beds. Those numbers are also increasing, but in a way that um, is, is, is uh, again, very, very heavily among those are, who are unvaccinated. And I told you we would create a Chicago version of that graph that we showed um, last week and, and I think on Tuesday as well. So in Chicago, this is just highlighting for Chicago residents of everybody who's been vaccinated here in green, the red represents breakthrough cases, um, and then the yellow represents breakthrough deaths. And so this is the 99.9% um, have not developed the breakthrough case of COVID and uh, continuing to see um, the increase from there where 99.9%, 99% have not been hospitalized, 99.999% have not died, and we continue to follow that for cases um, and vaccinations. I also, this is a good news thing that normally I put at the end, but I did just want to go ahead and call it out uh, so I didn't forget. So there are five weeks that are happening right now um, for folks who may still be out of a job um, as a result of COVID or just be looking for a new area uh, of employment. There's a big push um, that's called Hire Chicago that just started this week and is running through uh, early September. And each week um, there are interviews and free job prep workshops. And then there are the ability to actually interview for jobs with a lot of different types of employers. So this first week, is a focus on manufacturing. The week of August 9th is hospitality, tourism, and food service. The next week is transportation, distribution, and logistics. The next week is healthcare. And the last week, the week of August 30, is technology. So go to HireChicago2021.org if you or anybody you know is interested in jobs in these really uh, quickly growing industries here in Chicago and you want to learn more about the space and make some connections. Uh, really hoping to, to get a lot of people um, um, working in these areas. And it's, you can see it's sponsored by the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership, World Business um, Chicago, as well as the city. So I uh, just wanted to share that. And with that, we will turn to your questions. <clears throat> okay. Lots of things coming in already. All right, have I heard of the Delta, this is Michelle. Have I heard of the Delta Plus variant? Is it more infectious? Are we seeing any of these cases in the Midwest? Um, similarly, we've got PK. Can I address the Lambda variant? Is it in Chicago? Okay, so we talked a little bit about variants on Tuesday, um, and I'm always happy to take questions about variants. As a reminder, there are variants of interest, which are the lowest level, there's variants of concern, and then there's variants of high consequence. We've never had a variant yet that is, has been considered a variant of high consequence. If we did, that would be a very big deal. It would mean that we would probably need to be doing another round of vaccinations or making major changes, um, but we've not seen anything that the WHO, the CDC, anybody has labeled this variant of high consequence. We do have some of these variants of concern. The one that has been getting the most attention right now, of course, is the Delta variant. And so this Delta plus variant, quote unquote, that Michelle is asking about is actually um, sort of a, a subtype, if you will, of the Delta variant. Uh, and it's not really called Delta plus. That's what the, the media has been using the term Delta plus. All it is, it's the Delta, it's, it's the Delta variant 
variant, but we're also seeing one of the mutations that we had seen earlier in actually the, the beta um, variant of concern that's also in there. So it's more formally known as uh, AY.1. Um, there have been a handful of cases, uh, but not even 1% of cases uh, either here in the Midwest area or in the US um, have been identified um, as that AY.1. And to sort of the larger point, even within Delta, right, the formal name for Delta is B.1.617.2. It's hard for people to remember that. Um, but always when this is being followed, you can see these sort of smaller changes that remain the Delta variant that is named um, the variant of concern, but there can be some slight changes. And so trust me, the scientists absolutely track those sub pieces within it. So there's AY.1, which is the one that some people are labeling this Delta Plus. There's an AY.2, there's an AY.3. All of them have sh been shown to have the same amount of what's called neutralizing antibodies. Basically, um, the vaccine continues to work effectively. We've not seen anything at this point with any of these variants that makes it be acting significantly differently than Delta. And importantly, it's not outcompeting the original Delta strain. So among those three subtypes, um, you know, Delta is absolutely the dominant. We're seeing exactly the same thing happen in the US that we saw happen in the UK, that we saw happen in India, where there is a big surge when Delta comes because it is more contagious. It outcompetes whatever other variants are there. And so um, in early July, we were already at a point where more than 80% of uh, cases across the US and actually here in the Midwest area already were that Delta variant. Um, but if you break it down a little bit to this point of Delta and Delta Plus and A1, you know, technically 72% of them were the original Delta. And then there's like another 10% that were this Delta AY3. But in terms of how they're behaving, um, there's not been anything that's that's more concerning. Um, and, and in fact, the AY3, which is the one that the, the subtype that there's more of, those numbers are actually going down while this, the original, if you will, Delta variant um, is stronger and outcompeting. So all I would say is that whether it's Delta, we talked a little bit about Lambda the last time. You're going to keep hearing about variants. Lambda has not been labeled a variant of concern. Um, where there is a variant of, if there is ever a variant of high consequence, you will not miss that news. That will be a very big deal. It would probably mark significant changes to what we needed to do at the societal level uh, to potentially control the, the virus. Otherwise, these variants of concern show up for sure in the way alpha showed up in the way delta showed up they're more contagious they might they could make people sicker they could make the vaccine less effective um, and so it's you know part of the reason that we've made this uh, recommendation for the moment for people to have their masks back on in indoor public settings what even if they're vaccinated is just because we're getting through the surge of delta right now but it's already here uh, to that point um, you know probably more than 90 percent at this point are already the delta variant so it's not that we're waiting for it to arrive. It is very much here, um, but, but it's not behaving in any way differently um, than we would expect. OK. Um, we've got Matt via email. Um, mRNA technology safety is based on past usages. I think asking, can we talk about mRNA technologies? Oh, OK. Can we talk about mRNA technology safety based on past usages? Um, Matt says, I say this because I have seen that mRNA technology was used in cancer advancements before. Why were those not taken or gone past the clinical stage? Did the cure not work? Were there issues with the technology? Um, if the mRNA has never had issues, why didn't the cure work? Uh, basically, can you just talk some more about the history of mRNA vaccines? Yeah, Matt, thanks, thanks for the, those questions. They're really good. Um, and they raise for me uh, a similar range of questions that, that we've gotten and that I continue to hear on social media is just that there are still a lot of people, I think, who don't trust the science um, behind how these vaccines came to be. Uh, how were they developed so quickly? Um, how can we trust that, that something that seems so new is is uh, has been has had all the appropriate testing. And so I would point you, um, there's actually a really, really nice 
journal article in Nature, um, um, Nature Drug Reviews specifically. It's from before COVID. It's actually from January of 2018, but it's this big summary of what scientists were already doing related to mRNA vaccines. And the title of it is literally mRNA vaccines, a new era in vaccinology, which means um, testing vaccines. And um, I'm just gonna read you a couple of sentences from this. And then for those of you who have more science questions, I'd refer you to this. mRNA vaccines represent a promising alternative to conventional vaccine approaches because of their high potency, meaning they work really well, capacity for rapid development and potential for for low cost manufacture and safe administration. However, their application, meaning our ability to use them, has until recently been restricted by the instability and inefficient in vivo, meaning in live uh, individuals, delivery of mRNA. What that's basically saying is they were able to show in the lab um, and, and in some animal models but they were having a lot of trouble stabilizing the mRNA molecules. So there's been work not just to develop the mRNA technology, but actually one of the most important things was the work to figure out how to stabilize these really fragile um, messenger, these fragile messengers in little droplets of fat, for example, lipids, uh, so that they actually can, can, um, can last long enough uh, to be able to, you know, I mean, they don't need to last that long, but they need to last long enough to be able to be injected. Um, and they never get incorporated into the DNA in any way, but they teach your cells uh, to make the proteins to fight off um, COVID. And so if you read these articles and others, what you see is that the very earliest mRNA um, vaccine reports uh, that were used in mice, for example, go all the way back to 1990. It's been, you know, t what is that, 20, 30 years um, that, that this field developed. And there have been, some of the cancer spaces have been some of the work that I think has been the most promising, but there has, there's been work that developed around Zika and Ebola and other um, diseases, but it's, it, it took a very large influx of funding and urgency, frankly, to bring these smaller studies uh, to scale for the COVID vaccine. And so the difference really was that the government decided we're gonna invest billions of dollars uh, in making sure that all of this science gets focused on, gets done, and we're gonna focus on figuring out the manufacturing and the stabilization process um, while doing all of the safety work. And so um, I think the fact that these vaccines have performed so incredibly well um, for COVID is not a surprise to the scientists who've been working in this space for a long time. You know, Moderna, for example, has been around for 10 years, right? Doing nothing but working on creating mRNA. Uh, Pfizer BioNTech, which is the German company that, that is aligned with Pfizer, was doing mRNA vaccine work far before this, um, but more on an experimental scale. And frankly, for things like an Ebola vaccine, there was not the financial incentive in some ways for for the companies to take the risk. It's, it's, it's extremely expensive to do very large scale trials. And they're worried that if not a lot of people are going to want to purchase this vaccine, not a lot of governments are going to want to buy it, um, it's, they don't always make the decision to, to, to do some of those riskier studies. But because, because governments around the world basically said to scientists, we'll front the cost of, of, of further development, not all the vaccines made it across the finish line, right? Like all along, the, you know, Merck had done a number of vaccines that really just didn't pan out um, in terms of an efficacy standpoint. Like, like, but Merck itself didn't lose um, a lot of money over that. The, the various governments around the world, right, were the ones who really adopted it. Uh, and so I, I am sure we are going to see mRNA technology um, for other um, infectious diseases. And I think also um, the, all of this work has moved the needle on trying to think about uh, some of the, you know, quote unquote, cancer um, vaccine or cancer uh, treatments using some of the same technology. So um, I hope that helps maybe reassure a little bit. If you're thinking this is brand new, we can maybe post just a link to this article if you're interested in some more of the science. But there's 227, 222 uh, individual studies that are listed in this one 
one review article from early 2018. Um, and there's been obviously many, many more since then. So the newer vaccines um, and really the success of safe and effective vaccine is built on decades of um, work that came before. OK. Um, so we've got some more questions. Uh, Dan Sullivan on Twitter is saying, I've heard the heavy lifting on the Moderna vaccine was done over a weekend in January 2020. Why can't Moderna and Pfizer essentially reprint a vaccine using the Delta spike protein and immediately start distributing it? Flu vaccines are brought out new every year. Uh, yeah, thanks for that, Dan. That's an interesting sort of framing and, and good set of questions. So first of all, you know, the heavy lifting on the Moderna vaccine, quote unquote, uh, you know, you heard me say, Moderna was working on this for about a decade before that. Um, certainly, you know, in terms of that work in January 2020 was pivoting a lot of the work that that was that they were already doing around other diseases and pivoted that toward COVID um, in the same way that laboratories all over the world did. Um, but that was built on top of, um, you know, decades, um, honestly, of, of research. And so this question of why can't they essentially reprint a, a vaccine using the Delta spike program and also that flu vaccines are brought out new every year. So flu vaccines are brought out new every year because flu uh, mutates ridiculously more than COVID does. Like ridiculously more. There are whole strains of flu. There's influenza A, there's influenza B. You know, you hear about H1N1, you hear about uh, there's the world of like variability in influenza is huge and varied. So much more variable, so many more variants, so much more mutation than anything that we have seen happen for COVID or any of the coronaviruses. And so the reason we make a flu vaccine every year is because every single year, the scientists are actually looking at which strange, which variants, if you will, of flu are the most dominant. So they're kind of doing what you're suggesting. They're saying, you know, the, the equivalent of the Delta strain of the flu vaccine, although there aren't Delta strains of the flu vaccine, but you get the idea. Like whatever the strain of the flu, flu vaccine is that is the most prominent, you want to make sure the vaccine that you're going to be giving out for the next flu season covers that variant. But because it mutates so much, you can't cover all of the types of variants, if you will. And that's part of why the flu vaccine is also not 100% uh, protective. And actually, within public health every year, we talk about how good the match is. How well were we able to take, because the summer and winter um, are in opposite hemispheres, when we're making the flu vaccine for the northern hemisphere's winter, we're looking at what flu viruses are circulating the six months before in the southern hemisphere's winter, if that makes sense, and vice versa. And so there is a continuous production um, of flu vaccines based on that, but it still takes months and months to, um, to produce those. And so in the case of the COVID and even the Delta, we've not had at this point evidence that the vaccines are significantly losing efficacy. Um, we certainly have seen a little bit of decrease there, but some of that decrease is more about like levels of antibody than it is actual decrease in protection. And antibodies are not the only way that we measure protection from a vaccine. Antibodies are like what your body has right on hand um, to be able to fight off an infection. But your immune system is complicated. There's B cells, there's T cells, that if you're exposed, not just to COVID, but to some pathogen, some germ, and you've seen it before, or you've been vaccinated against it before, uh, those B cells and, and T cells can do their work to sort of churn up the immune system again and you know produce more antibodies and so it's not just about what you have at that moment it's about some of these sort of longer term lessons that your immune system um, learns and so as a reminder we've been studying 
in a large scale way in humans, these vaccines for um, you know more than a year at this point, uh, we don't have concerns at all, to be clear, about, about sort of long-term side effects. Uh, Always in vaccines where we've seen long-term side effects, they come within the first six weeks. But obviously, at this level, you want to follow and look for that, and we continue to do that. Really, the bigger questions, at least for me, where I'm, I and everybody are interested in, the, in, in having these studies continue, which they are for years, is measuring things like the level of antibodies in people after a year, after two years, after three years, comparing to see what breakthrough infections look like, right? This is why CDPH and all over the country, we're putting such a lot of resources into investigating every case that we identify as a potential breakthrough case or every case of a reinfection, um, because maybe it's a variant, but also what are we learning about waning immunity? But the news really is good. And so I do think at some point we may see a booster recommendation, but we're more likely to see that, I, I think, we'll see, right? We're more likely to see that, I think, for particular populations, as we do for other diseases, even flu. There are stronger versions of the flu vaccine, for example, that in certain years are kind of designed for people over 65. Might we have, might there be a recommendation for a booster shot at some point for people over a given age um, or people with immune conditions, I think is probably the most likely we may, uh, immune compromise conditions, only certain ones. Might we see that at some point? We've shared some data um, even with you on Facebook here about some of what we're learning there, um, possibly people in nursing homes. And we're part of those studies. We're contributing information about what we're seeing and learning. But the recommendation for you know not needing a, 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 a booster dose at this point is kind of to that point. The WHO also, I don't know if you saw this, but um, just in the last day or two, they really released an ask that the wealthy countries of the world not do booster vaccines until at least 10% of the world's population has gotten at least a first dose of vaccine. I, the things we have to worry about the most in a long-term global perspective from COVID, obviously at a Chicago level, I'm very worried about people who have not yet gotten vaccinated, but at a global level where so much of the world still does not have access to vaccines. Those are the settings that we're more likely to see um, new variants emerge and getting the world vaccinated is just as critical as, as, as getting sort of the US vaccinated. And we're not gonna be able to sort of booster, 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 booster our way out of this. We need to sort of think about some of this vaccine equity. And so, you know, they really asked, which doesn't mean there might not be a recommendation for a certain group, um, but generally to put that focus on, on getting at least 10% of the, of the world vaccinated. You know, you look at India, um, India got hit in incredibly hard with the Delta variant. Uh, and that's because there was almost no vaccine on the ground. Still only I think 7% of India is fully vaccinated against COVID. That is dangerous, um, particularly with these new variants emerging. We are lucky to be sitting in a country where we have vaccines sitting on shelves unused. Um, but it is in terms of my worry, Yes, of course, what I have the most control over is, is what we can do in Chicago, and that's why we're working so hard to continue to, to, to encourage folks, especially with the, with the Delta surge, like now is the time if you haven't done it. Um, but at that larger level, there's that too. So the pharmaceutical companies are doing all that work. They are very ready to go when and if there is need for a booster, but um, we've not seen anything that says a Delta, for example, that would be a requirement. And as, th as we continue to learn about this, um, it's possible that recommendation may come, um, but it's not there now. I have not gotten a booster, to be perfectly clear. I have not recommended it uh, for a single person. And um, it's, it's, it's something we may need in the future. Uh, we may not, um, but it's not like flu. Good question. All right. Um, Aaron Hoffman from Facebook. Do you recommend getting a COVID test for folks who went to Lollapalooza? When would be the best time to get tested? Okay, good question, Aaron. 
So um, obviously we're doing a lot of um, follow-up, uh, just as we do after large gatherings. We continue to investigate every single case of COVID that gets diagnosed in the city of Chicago. Uh, just as a quick aside, uh, please answer your phone if, uh, this is, if the Chicago Department of Public Health calls you or contact tracer calls you. It's from 312-742-6843. It actually shows up as um, Chicago contact tracer, I believe, but it depends on if you're on a cell phone etc. 312-742-6843. Um, you can put that in your phone so it's not an unknown number, although we do try to leave messages and other things. Um, but we will continue to investigate. So really our recommendation around Lollapalooza, um, uh, obviously we're especially interested in this because it was a, a highly vaccinated event. Uh, truly, you know, more than 90% of the folks in there vaccinated, the rest tested. Uh, our concern is much less about the actual event than it is some of the indoor gatherings that may have happened around it, but for sure, we want, we want to explore this. Anybody who has any symptoms that might be COVID, whether you went to Lala or not, okay, to be clear, anybody in Chicago, if you've got a quote summer cold if you're like i feel like i have the flu that's weird i'm just not feeling well please 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 take a COVID test whether you're vaccinated whether you're not you can take the ones that are over the counter i'm fine with that but take a test i leave i've got tests sitting you know you can buy these two packs for about 20 Three or twenty-four dollars um, from Walmart, from Walgreens, from CVS, um, from other uh, merchants. Um, you can have them delivered from those same folks via DoorDash. You don't even have to leave your home. Um, I have those, and that's a two-pack that you get for that amount. Um, it's a self-test. Uh, you get the result in about fifteen minutes, and I keep those at home. And I would encourage folks um, to have those at home so that if you've got a symptom of any kind, just take a test, and then you can feel confident um, that it's not COVID. So first, anybody who has symptoms, if they attended Lala, but even if they didn't attend Lala, take a test. Um, other than that, if people are um, unvaccinated, right? We said that would also be, um, in terms of the, the, the gathering, um, would make that recommendation. And we're at a point, you know, we are right now, um, it was a week ago that that first day happened. So, you know, it was a four day event. Again, it's not just the event, it's the things around it. Um, so we are starting to be in the time frame where if you're, if, you're, uh, if you're curious, if you're wanting to get a test, et cetera, you can go ahead and do that. Um, and we will continue to do all of the extra surveillance and follow up and work, you know, the additional, you know, the regular things that we do for every case, some additional follow up, of course, um, related to the large gatherings. And just to kind of give you a little sense of this, it's not just Lala, right? We, we do this sort of comprehensive look at large gatherings and at settings um, across Chicago. So like this coming weekend, for example, is uh, market days. Um, and that is another large outdoor event. This one happens to be in the public way. It's sort of more of a street festival. But just like our vaccine ambassadors were on site at Lollapalooza and they're talking to people and, um, you know, are you vaccinated? Are you tested? There's testing available. Uh, we're doing some extra testing to understand risk. We're um, uh, signing folks up for vaccine. We're giving out proud to be vaccinated stickers. And we've worked with the organizers, the business group, um, particularly for the the, the bars and the, and the um, other sort of party type settings that are around some of these events who have largely said, we'll look for vaccination or testing results um, to be able to come into these indoor spaces. And it's that kind of work that, again, helps keep the risk low, um, low for folks. If folks come in and, you know, they, they don't bring a proof of vaccination, we'll offer them some testing available on the, stop, on the spot if they're interested. Um, again, the indoor is of more concern and just give vaccinated like if everybody's vaccinated and you come to these settings um, really what we know about indoor events continues to be that that risk remains low uh, and we'll be exploring some more um, and so not just market days but you know looking ahead to some of the parades etc you know what we're there to get the information out about vaccine get folks signed up and make sure that um, where there are things that may need additional attention in terms of us learning about risk for COVID, needing to change recommendations, um, we wanna be on site. And uh, we've got a plan for that that goes far beyond Lala, although that has been so much of the, the media attention. Um, 
Spider on Twitter says, hi, I'm scared to give my child the second shot due to the risk of myocarditis. Why doesn't the CDC recommend one shot to limit the risk of issues? Unfortunately, saying the cases are mild does not make me feel comfortable. Okay, good question, Spider. So um, for folks who maybe haven't been following this uh, so closely, myocarditis um, literally means um, some inflammation you know, of, 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 of the heart, or potentially of the, of, the, of the heart muscle. And myocarditis is is, is, a, is not common. It is a very rare condition at baseline. Um, it is one that we have seen in children who have been diagnosed with COVID, to be clear. It's also one of the things that they've been concerned about where they've looked at um, college athletes who have gotten uh, COVID, not COVID vaccine, who have gotten COVID. Um, some of the best studies of that where they went and actually did um, ultrasounds of the hearts of these like elite athletes. Um, there was a big study that found like more than 2% of them, like one in 50 of these of these athletes that had that, that got COVID actually had a form of this very mild myocarditis after COVID. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we've been really aggressive around recommending COVID vaccination um, for athletes, for uh, you know, college and, and those settings, um, because the risk is much higher for this if people get COVID. However, what was also seen, again, very low numbers, but there was a slightly um, increased risk after the vaccine uh, for um, some of the, it, it was a little bit higher in men, in, in sort of teenage boys than it was in teenage girls. It was also a little more likely after the second dose, to spider, the spider's question here, than it was after the first dose. But it was still, a, like very, very low. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but I'll bring them next next, uh, next time we're up so we can, because it's been a little while since we talked about these exact numbers, but much, much lower than the risk of this with actually getting COVID. And then importantly to this thing of, you know, I understand saying the cases are mild doesn't make you feel comfortable, but it's not just that they were mild, it's that people have recovered entirely. And so we see, um, we, you know, as people have a robust immune response, part of that robust immune response sometimes can be um, temporary uh, sort of revving up. And, and there has, there's been seen a little bit of this. And that's part of why um, as, as the CDC, as uh, the FDA are looking at uh, the approval for some of these younger children, they've asked for some of the um, numbers to get expanded so that we can make sure there's even some bigger sample sizes. Because, uh, you know, we want to be really confident that when we're saying um, these vaccines are safe and recommended uh, for children, that they are. And so all of the recommendations from every public health agency, from all the pediatrics agencies, like you look up the group, um, definitely say you should, um, for children, um, absolutely, the recommendation is to get both doses of the vaccine the only recommendation that changed was that if a child or anybody uh, developed the myocarditis or the pericarditis, again, mild resolves after a first dose, they did recommend just not giving the second dose in that setting. But that's different than my child got the first dose and didn't get, get, get the second. So um, what I have recommended um, um, to you know, my own family, to patients, to folks who have asked, is absolutely to get those second doses um, because we want to protect kids. You know, if your biggest concern is your child getting myocarditis, then getting the vaccine um, is is actually important because the risk of them getting myocarditis from COVID is is so much higher. So, yeah, really good question. If you've got more about that, uh, go ahead and send it in. And um, on Tuesday, maybe the next time we're back, um, I'll bring a little bit of those numbers and we can put it in some context with, with Chicago numbers um, here too, so you have a sense. Um, all right, we are just about at time. Um, maybe I'll just take quickly. Justin says, the news says you were turned away from Lala because you didn't have proof of vaccination. What's the deal? Oh my goodness, you guys. The amount of craziness around like Lala and me is just a little bit crazy. Let me be very clear. <laughs> I am fully vaccinated. I have full proof of vaccination. 
One of my goals of going to Lala, which I did multiple times, was to actually know what the screening process was. Not as Dr. Arwady with an entourage where, you know, you're going to get a song and dance potentially, but as just as all the people are who are coming through. So, yes, I put on a hat. Yes, I put on sunglasses. Yes, I put on a mask um, and went through by myself. And the point is I was bringing different kinds of my proof of vaccination because I wanted to see what the folks would do with it. I was really pleased that like, for example, you know, I've got my CDC card, but I also brought, I brought a printout of what's called my eye care registry, which is the, the formal state registry, but it's got not just my COVID, it's got my tetanus, it's got my um, HPV vaccines, like all the vaccination records are in there. And I was really curious, right? Like, is this a sort of just wave and you're through or are people actually looking at it? And I was very reassured that people People were, you know, they don't know who I am and, and not just me, but the other folks in line, they're looking, you know, I got to see the COVID. Where are the dates? Where is this from? Has it been the right amount of time? If it was tests, you know, what is the time frame on tests? And we did have a couple of our CDPH folks um, and the, some of the, um, the core that does the vaccine ambassador work. A couple of them actually the first day did show up without, they forgot their proof of vaccination. They got turned away, that's good, right? They had to go get their proof of vaccination to come back um, and or bring a negative test. So it was not that I got turned away because I'm not vaccinated. Um, it was that I went multiple times because I knew I was gonna be answering questions about this and I wanted to see with my own eyes um, what was happening. It's also why CDPH had folks uh, inside the gates there, um, you know, doing some some follow-up checking around what were we seeing for, for vaccination rates. So uh, that's the deal. Apparently, this is now a national Fox News story. And I will just say that there are more interesting things to talk about, in my opinion. But, you know, I guess I'll answer questions um, where the world continues to be interested or try to twist uh, information. So um, that's where we are. And uh, I hope that helps. Um, clear it up. I was actually vaccinated on television, if anybody would like to go back and watch the proof of that. Um, but clearly, I am vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much for joining. Um, thank you for those of you who are sending in questions. Please keep sending them in. Um, and like I said, where we get something um, that I think may that we're he seeing re repeated, we'll bring some Chicago specific data. Um, my only goal is to help answer your questions, help answer uh, questions for your friends and family or for anybody who hasn't decided to get vaccinated. No shame if you've not gotten vaccinated yet, but like now's the time really because almost all of our hospitalizations and deaths, like almost all of them are now largely avoidable. And I just don't want us to I don't like to unnecessarily see people suffer, right? I'm a doctor. And um, getting vaccinated is the way to help us all get past this, but it's also the way to help keep your friends and family and neighborhood and whatever you care about uh, safe. So thanks again. We will be back next week uh, answering more of your questions. In the meantime, you can keep using the hashtag AskDrRWD, um, and we'll keep putting information up. Thanks again.